It's um, a great pleasure for me to share with you some of our work on how to move the needle on gender equality here in Melbourne, in Victoria, in Australia, but really around the world. As Cheryl said, I'm a behavioral economist and I'm very passionate about bringing rigor to the question of gender equality. And I often argue that we use more rigor in our marketing departments than in our HR departments. And you'll see today, I'm gonna to try to show some data that suggests that in fact, we would be very well advised to use that rigor in our people management as well. So with that, let me introduce you to Heidi Roizen. Heidi Roizen is a venture capitalist in Silicon Valley. She is a very successful entrepreneur and she's interesting for our purpose right now because we use a case study about her to teach our students about the power of unconscious bias in a matter of seconds, really. Because half of our students now get the case with the protagonist being called Heidi, which is her real name, and that is she. Um, and the other half gets the case with the protagonist being called Howard. And then they prepare for class, but also fill out a questionnaire where they uh, evaluate how well Heidi and Howard did, but also how likable Heidi and Howard are. And sadly, what we find time and again is that people agree that both Heidi and Howard did a great job, but we do not like Heidi. We don't like her because she defies our stereotypes of what a typical woman does, and she defies our stereotypes of what a venture capitalist looks like. The short summary of that is implicit or unconscious bias, and so that's what we're up against. And of course, it plays out in lots of different domains. So recently, I looked for an icon for expert, and I chose some random web page where there were 224 icons for experts, and exactly six were of women. So experts aren't women, and neither are people in sports. Um, as Cheryl said, one of the work that we do with Vic Health is to look at um, sports reporting, um, and that's just an example of how difficult it is for the world record um, breaker and gold medalist um, to be featured on the front page. So that's what we're up against, um, but let me ask you for just a moment to have a look at this checkerboard here and compare squares A and B for me. I presume that most of you see square B as being lighter than square A. I'm now gonna cover the surroundings and I presume that about now, you realize that in fact, B has exactly the same color. I know it's hard to believe, so let me go back. I, sometimes I know verification is better than trust. Um, <laughs> in fact, uh, I have not done anything to B, but this, of course, is an illusion. And what's happening in your brain is that your brain makes sense of the pattern that you see. And this is a checkerboard, and you know that a light square has to be next to a dark square. When I cover the surroundings, quite literally, I'm liberating your minds to do justice to be. I also wanted to go back for a second reason. I wanted to go back to suggest to you that even though you now know that B is just another light square, another dark square, excuse me, another dark square, your mind is incapable of doing justice to be. Right? So sometimes raising awareness is the answer, and sometimes raising awareness might open doors but doesn't actually solve the problem. In fact, what solves the problem is that I cover the surroundings, and we would in fact argue that this is pretty analog uh, analogous to how we evaluate people, and that just raising awareness of unconscious bias is likely not going to be enough to in fact move the needle, but we have to do something a bit more drastic. So covering the surroundings means that I make it impossible for you to see a pattern. Right now, you're fine to see squares A and B, but I have removed the pattern, and of course the world is full of patterns because we don't see many female venture capitalists, we don't associate venture capitalists with women, because we don't see many male nurses or kindergarten teachers, we don't associate nursing with men, and that makes it so much harder for male nurses to succeed in their jobs. This is, in fact, a real life example. So we can do this, 
enact an example that some of you probably have heard about, that in the 70s, many of the major symphony orchestras in the United States have introduced curtains and had musicians audition behind a curtain. Why? Because they were nervous that might, that they might, just might, not be able to hear the quality of the music when they see what somebody looks like. It turns out that the curtain helped increase the fraction of women on the major US orchestras from about five percentage points in the 70s to now almost 40%. So that's the curtain. So blind evaluations or helping us remove the patterns from our decision making is in fact a real intervention that not just orchestras but a number of additional organizations including here in Australia have been playing with. We can blind ourselves to demographic characteristics of people's CVs. So this is one example of behavioral design and that's the journey I'd like to take you on today over lunch to give you a bit of a sense of what we might be able to do by using these insights from behavioral economics to de-bias, as Cheryl said, how we live, how we learn, and how we work. In fact, I'll focus most on how we work today, but if you're interested in my book, um, I talk about many more applications in schools, in society more broadly. So that's what we're up against here. Um, this is kind of a summary of uh, the title um, of our session, you know, how to move from intentions to action. Yeah, uh, there are many things that seem really simple and in fact, they're not. So let me give you another example of behavioral design just to trigger your thinking and your imagination a little bit. So pretty much a year ago, um, I spent a day in Stockholm with the Nobel Prize committees and they had called for help because they had realized that 90, 97% of all Nobel Prizes in the sciences have been awarded to men. And so they were concerned about the question of unconscious bias and we did many, many things. Much of this is pretty secretive as you might imagine, but here's one example that now is very public. And let me give you a little background of why I suggested to them um, what you will um, see on the screen in just a moment. I was influenced by very old research in psychology where people were trying to understand um, people's eating behaviors. They went into a high school and they offered students snack choices. And in fact, like half of you, imagine, would be participating in this experiment right now and would be asked to choose a snack for every day of the next month now. You have hundreds of snacks in front of you and you choose 30 snacks now. The other half of the room or of the high school was asked to choose a snack every morning of the day for today, 30 times in a row, right? So you are the sequential choice group and you are the simultaneous choice group. And what the researchers found was that this group here was much more likely to go for variety because you all, every morning you were thinking, well, you know, apple or chocolate bar today? Well, maybe today is that chocolate day. And then tomorrow, you know, I'm saying this as Swiss, of course, being biased. But, um, and that's exactly what they find, found, that people were much more likely to go for their favorite snack. Um, while this group here, making 30 choices now, just could not imagine wanting to have a chocolate bar every day. So we've applied this to people decisions, that when we hire or promote in bundles, we found, Diversity is much more likely to emerge because now you're thinking of, uh, of the people you hire, for example, more as a portfolio that you really don't want to have eight of the same from the same school who look the same, skin color, demographic, sexual orientation, you know, whatever it might be. So this was my advice to the Nobel Committee. So I'm one of the ones who gets a letter every year asking me to nominate people for the Nobel Prize in economics. And I noticed that I'm always asked to nominate one person only. So I said um, to the committee, you know, there's one thing you could be doing, I mean, many things, of the many things, but here's one thing that I think would be actually quite easy. Uh, there's no rule prohibiting you from asking me to nominate three people. And then you choose from the three that I nominate and many other people nominate as well. And that's exactly, so that's the form that you see. So the new form that I got this year asked me to nominate three people. And um, I imagine that in fact will have um, some good impacts um, going forward. It's actually last year that they introduced it for the first time. Last year was um, 
saw the biggest um, fraction of women receiving prizes for the first time. But of course, this is not science. Um, I'm just giving this as an illustration of how simple behavioral design sometimes can be in that you just change a form a little bit. So my goal for us, and um, that's, is kind of, of course, um, pretty ambitious, is to make it easier for all of us to get this right. Many of you must have been in a hotel room where the room key card did not just serve the purpose of opening and closing doors, but also of turning lights on and off. So that's, um, I know, a high aspiration, and I can't promise that we'll get there, but that's a bit what I have in mind in terms of advancing the needle on gender equality, really thinking about how we can redesign the systems to make it possible for us to, in fact, bridge this gap between intentions and actions. So this, of course, is very different from the many of things that many of your organizations, I'm sure, have been doing in the past 50 years. Uh, the book spent a lot of time talking about the research, examining you know, which of these interventions work. But let me just summarize quickly here by saying, none of this will be enough. This is not going to be enough. Very hard to devise mindsets and not a great strategy to always try to fix the women. So let's um, think a bit more about what we can do. I want to give you kind of two buckets of possible answers. One focuses a bit more on formal procedures and one a bit more on informal procedures. So um, I'm starting with um, a simple observation here that I made at the beginning that in our marketing departments, we've actually become quite rigorous. And a few years ago, Coca-Cola realized that men were not buying Diet Coke. That could have lots of reasons, but they realized that through rigorous research that diet was not a male word. And so they introduced Coke Zero. You know, if Coca-Cola, this is not an advertisement for Coca-Cola, but if Coca-Cola can do this, and of course, you know, Pepsi has introduced Pepsi Max, all soft drink companies have learned this, that there's male words and female words. If they can do this, and as Gerald said, we thought we can do this for job advertisements. You can use these decoders, not just on job placements, but you can use them on your letters of recommendation, on lots of other things that you do. And when you use a decoder, you will see, and you will be surprised probably, as I was, how likely we are to use gendered language and are much more likely to highlight her collaboration skills and his assertiveness. So that's, um, I think, a low-hanging fruit that any organization should think about. But of course, it gets more complicated as people are in the door. It gets more complicated because all of us think that we are really good at looking into each other's eyes and just knowing whether you're a good fit for my company or not. So it turns out that interviews, in particular in unstructured interviews where we just have a bit of a chat, are the worst predictor of future performance. Um, they're still much beloved, um, but they in fact don't work very well. Now what are the two things you can be thinking about? First, move from unstructured to structured interviews where you ask the same questions of every candidate in the same order. And secondly, you might also want to think about something that we want to call a work sample test which measures, which is much closer to the kind of work that the person will be doing in the future. If this is something that interests you, I wrote a short article on this for the Harvard Business Review um, on how we, in fact, can take bias out of this talent management process. Oh, excuse me. Uh, in addition, there's technology that is quite helpful. This is, in fact, a bit of a byproduct of my work that I hadn't expected, but I'm very happy to say that we now have an increasing number of tech startups which have taken the insights from behavioral science and turned them into technology, into tech platforms, which help us hire more effectively, promote more effectively, create more inclusive cultures. But let me end um, kind of the discussion on formal procedures by two quick remarks. Another place you might want to go to if you're interested in some of these guidelines is the Equalities Office of the UK. Um, I'm an advisor for them, and we have spent quite a bit of time helping uh, making gender pay gaps more transparent. As you know, in the UK, companies with more than 250 employees have to report publicly their gender pay gaps. Um, and we have spent even more time thinking about guidelines for companies that actually want to make a difference. Uh, so another resource at your disposal. 
The second um, uh, comment before I talk about something a bit more informal is that many of you rightly probably now think, but the action is not just in hiring, it's really in career advancement. So let me give you a bit of insight on this. So we recently did work with a big multinational. This is the actual company. What you see here are the different um, hierarchy levels in the company. And normally when we work with a company, the first thing we, did, we do is a diagnostic. So we're trying to understand what's really broken. Why do we have the gender gaps that we're observing? Is it because you don't hire women? Is it because you don't promote women? Is it because women are more likely to leave? And then we found in this company, in fact, as we find a lot, that the gender gap is all in promotions. So then we looked at something that you now that we coined performance reward bias. So what I'm going to show you on the x-axis are people's performance ratings. And they are from one to five, with five being the best one. And on the y-axis, you'll see the likelihood of being promoted. Right? What you would expect is that there's some positive correlation. If you're a one, you probably get the signal that you should leave the company. Um, if you're five, you, you, know, you probably have a better chance of being promoted, although promotion rates, of course, are always small. OK, so then we looked at gender differences in those promotion rates. And in red, we have women. In blue, we have men. So if you're a low performer, you know, there's no gender difference. If you're kind of in the middle, you're number three, there's not much of a difference. And then when you are a very high performer, um, the fact that you don't see a red bar is not a mistake in the presentation, but in fact, it turns out performance ratings were not correlated with promotions for women at all. So that, of course, was like you know, an eye-opener for the company, um, and that's what we're working on right now. We created something that we call the gender promotion ratio, where we now inform managers of their track record of promoting men and women Com com in comparison to the available pool. It turns out just knowing what you've done in the last five years is enough for these managers to, to, to do better, which of course suggests that much of this happens unintentionally and inadvertently. Okay, so in the last um, couple of minutes, and I might have to talk a bit more about that in the Q&A to not keep you from eating much longer. So I just want to take two more minutes. I want to give you a bit of, quick, uh, bit of a quick sense of what more we could be doing beyond just talent management. So yes, we kind of know this is not the goal for our boards. And in fact, um, Australia has done quite well, in particular in recent years, you probably are aware that you have been able to increase gender diversity on your corporate boards by 10 percentage points in just two years. So this is quite amazing. Was shareholder investor pressure plus some goal setting. Um, but yes, I'm showing you this just to make the obvious point that numbers do matter, right? Diverse teams outperform homogenous teams. So numbers do matter. But I do want to leave you with two observations. One, yes, it is the numbers, but it's also people who kind of stand out, the champions, the role models, people you can look up to. Do not underestimate. The importance of seeing is believing. And that's not just we have to have 50% women in leadership roles, but also means that they, these leaders have to be visible and have to be, in fact, available to people who might aspire to those roles. And this is um, kind of research out of India, kind of showing that, in fact, role models really are important. I want to end by leaving you with this slide here um, and saying that, yes, diversity is important. We need the numbers. We need the role models. And thirdly, we need the right culture. So my question for you is quite simple. Where would you be more likely to drop a piece of paper? On the left beach or on the right beach? And what I'd love for you to think about over lunch is, what does your organization look like? Are you on the dirty beach or are you on the clean beach? Is the environment one where people feel entitled to drop sexist or racist or other hurting jokes? Is this environment where microaggressions flourish? Is it an environment where people are interrupted, interrupted, where people are not given credit for their comments? Or is this an environment that is safe for everyone to prosper and flourish? And on that note, I wish you a wonderful lunch and look forward to our discussion after lunch. Thank you very much.